Welcome to the only thing that matters, getting your startup to product market fit here on Chicago Founders TV. We're bringing you Hall of Fame level founder interviews focused on how they nailed product market fit. And today we have Brian Spaley, the founder of Trunk Club and Bonobos. This segment from Brian's founder story interview highlights how Bonobos was born out of a class at Stanford and the unusual way he got to product market fit. And uh, the other three of us spent the whole quarter working on, yeah, that was embarrassing. Yeah, I'm like, oh, Pat's project, and I'm cuckolded, awesome. So um, uh, Stanford was humbling in a lot of ways for me, because I, I didn't have a lot of the skills that a lot of the other people had. And, uh, and it gets worse, because I failed you know, in my first startup, too. But um, I, we, what we spent our time on was, does the market need this product? So we didn't write a business plan, we didn't build a model, we didn't, we didn't do any of that stuff, we just talked to guys. We went into their closets, we said, show us the pants that you have, tell us about how you interact with them, which ones do you wear, do you like any of the ones that you have, like where do you shop for them? We did, it, basically we were copying IDEO's methodology, their sort of in-depth consulting design methodology, and my best friend John Tucker at the time, who now is like a co-founder at Trunk Club, had, was working at IDEO. So I basically, oh, cool. he gave me a lot of advice on how to do this, and, we, and this is all we did, and then we wrote this report that was like, there is a massive need for better fitting men's pants, and we've talked to guys about it, and we ran a 250 person survey, mostly of like MBA types who were in our target market, and then we did these, we did 17, you know, hour long, with pictures and detailed notes interviews, and that was the project. And the marketing guy was like, this is cool, this is great, you guys should start this company. So he left the room, we got, we got the stamp, and I looked at the other two guys and I said, so how are we gonna split up the equity? Because this thing is gonna be a big company. And they looked at me and they were like, I have no desire to pursue this at all, I was just doing it to get credit. <laughs> and, but they were cool dudes, and they're still to this day friends. In fact, one is the founder of Wheels, which was just sold to um, Relay Rides. Jeff Miller. Before that, he worked at um, Better Place and got out of there when it was good to get out. The other fellow, Jeff Hurst, is a partner at McKinsey, and actually was going to be a partner at McKinsey and left, and he's some senior guy at HomeAway in Austin, or Airbnb, whatever, whichever one of those is in Austin, he works oh, there. So these guys are doing fine, but they didn't want, you know, and so there was this lesson for me, was like, oh man, it actually takes an enormous quantity of initiative to actually go from, okay, we did this project, to now I'm actually gonna produce a product. But that really gave me confidence that it could work. And so acting as, you know, just acting sort of independently in my second year, I went through the process of buying fabric, getting that pattern graded into different sizes. You know, so the pattern was a size 32, was the sample size, I had to make 34, 36, 38, work on the length, get samples made. And I did all so, that on my so, own. So, so, wait a second, back up, because this, like, this, you're not a coder, so you're not doing code. You're, no. you're, you're building pants. So. I speak the language of fabric and trousers and all that. I, right. I, that so it's but, an interesting, but, but, but it's kind of like coding. It's, no, it is. It's it all is. logic problems in right, the no, end. You, but, but this is what's interesting is you're, you decide to do this, but then you got to actually make pants. This, you said before, you know, making pants is actually hard. So you're at Stanford. You want to start this business. Everybody else said, you know, thanks for the A, got to go. So you're going to start this business. How does one start an apparel business in Palo Alto, California? So it's hard, and you know, um, I, the big stumbling block for me, Pat, was finding fabric. Um, and if I'd lived in New York or LA or known then what I know now, it would have taken me like a couple of weeks. Instead, it took me nine months. And um, I'll never forget, um, there's a business called uh, Quarter Rounds, which is like this horizontal corduroy company. And actually, they've done quite well. And it's now called Beta Brand. Like it turned into beta brand, and the founder is this fellow, Chris Lindland, who was the only person I could find who'd manufactured pants in his career. And I basically wrote him a love letter and, um, and tried to work for him. And I was basically like, I will work for you after business school if you would just hire me. And he's like, ah, you know, I, I don't need MBA types like you. Um, and so, but he was nice enough to give me a little bit of advice. And, uh, and that was sort of like, you, you might buy fabric here or whatever. And then one day, I was actually gonna go um, up to Tahoe, because we had a, a share house, you know, people pile in. That's like a big Stanford thing to do. It's a ski house in the winter. And I was gonna drive up there, and it was like March, and I was gonna get, I was, it was like 7 a.m., I'm in the driveway. I'll never forget this moment. This was like the seminal moment. I'm sharing a house with five other students in Atherton, California. And I'm putting my skis in the car. And I have this moment, it's like 7.05 in the morning. I'll never forget, it was like March 7th. I won't forget this day. 
ever. It was a Friday morning. I don't have class on Mondays, Wednesdays, or Fridays at Stanford, right? It's like very yeah, entrepreneurial. Thing yeah, very do. entrepreneurial to not have any class. And um, <laughs> and I and I'm I'm like, you know what? If I don't go buy fabric today, I'm never gonna make this happen. And so I took the skis out of the car. I went up to my room. I Googled Design District Los Angeles, having never spent a minute in any design district anywhere in the country, and, uh, and found the, the intersection 9th and Maple. I got in my car. I drove for six hours. I parked at 9th and Maple. I had $2,000 in cash in my pocket, and I bought like 41 yards of dark green like canvas twill that I could make uh, like my first run of trousers out of. And then I discovered this fabric store called Michael Levine, and it's this awesome, it's more of like a quilting store than like a, it's like a Minnesota fabrics, but in LA. Um, and I, I discovered all these magnificent patterned fabrics. And I thought, I can't make pants out of those, but maybe I can use them somehow in my product. Cause that's what I'm really drawn to as, a, as like a, the, the, the gayest straight man in the world, right? Like I, all I can think about is like how awesome these colors and like they're pinks and purples and flowers. And I'm like, if only I were a woman, I could just like wear all this stuff or if whatever. And so I was like, well, I gotta put them, I gotta put them on the inside of the products. And I'm actually wearing bonobos today. They got polka dots in the pocket. And that was how I came up with the idea for lining the waistband and the pockets with colorful fabrics that match the self. So after buying that roll of green cargo. Colorful fabrics that match the self, sorry. So um, in, a, in the parlance of the trouser world, the uh, fabric that is shown on the outside is usually referred to as the self or like on a jacket. And then the, the inside is called the liner. And so the self fabric, I bought all that green. Uh, I thought green would be a cool color instead of khakis. And then I discovered all these cool corduroys that had stretch in them, which is another big bailiwick for me because I got you know this big butt and stretch really helps if you gain weight, lose weight, all that stuff. So I, I paired these corduroy fabrics with these colorful prints. And then I went to a factory with my pattern and I said, please make me samples. And they said, you're crazy. You don't have any idea what you're doing. I said, here's my pattern. Here's my fabrics. Please make me samples. And they said, well, we'll charge you $250 for each sample, which is a lot. I, I never paid that much subsequently. And I said, okay, here's $1,500. Can you have them ready next week in cash? And they said, oh, no, 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 don't give us your cash. We don't, we don't, you know, we don't, we, that's not how it works here. And I was like, that's how I do business. Here's $1,500, please make my trousers. And they're like, all right, you're, you're for real. And I said, I will be here next week when they're ready. You call me, I'll show up. I, sh I would always show up 15 minutes early. The garment district is, in like the, the whole fashion world is filled with flaky people who have these ideas and don't follow up. And very few in, you know, former you know, private equity guys who walk around with cash and show up on time and pay and say, this is what I need, this is what I do. So I picked up those first five pairs of pants. I took them around to friends on campus. They were like, these are cool, I'd buy a pair. I went right back up to San Francisco and I made 20 more pairs. And I proceeded to ping pong back and forth between LA and the gar there's, a, there's like a very small garment district in the Bay Area. That actually, I use a cut and sew shop across the street from where the Giants play in Soma. And, uh, and I went back and forth and I made 20 pairs and then sold them, I made 80 pairs and then I sold them and I made 100 pairs and I sold them. I was just selling them to classmates and out of the trunk of my car. And I hadn't really spent any money on anything other than products and I had real revenue coming in. And that was, that was for me the sort of, that was when I really learned sort of the, the, the poetry of product market fit. It's like make something without spending that much money, make it yourself, learn how to do it, be authentic, and get it out in the market and sell it yourself. Number one problem I see the companies I angel invest in when they fail, and most of them do because I'm a terrible investor, is they're not good enough at sales, right? They, they, don't, they don't actually, like, they're not willing to go out and sell the dickens out of whatever it is they're making. So that's how Bonobos got started. So, so talk for a minute about, um, on Bonobos, some of the things you learned early on in product market fit. Like what, was the, what were some of the early lessons learned? Number one lesson. Of those five samples, four were brown corduroys with the same liner. The fifth pair was turquoise. And I was thinking like, all right, I'm paying 250 bucks for these samples. I might as well make, and they're all gonna fit me because I'm the fit model and I'm a 32 and like blah, blah, blah. Patterns made to fit me. I might as well make That's something. That's your fallback plan. If not, I just got a wardrobe. Exactly. Well, it's like, and I was like, why am I spending all this money on brown corduroys when I really only need one pair of brown corduroy? And I already have a bunch of brown. I love brown. I wear a lot of brown. Um, so I was like, why don't I make that tur? And I'd seen this turquoise corduroy I love so much. I just bought it. I bought like six yards of it for no good reason. I just couldn't help myself. I'm like, uh, just you know, uncontrollable in this fabric store, and um, and. <laughs> 
I mean, it's dangerous, right? You put like a, a well-financed MBA that's aggressive into a fabric store, and it's like you know weird well, shit happens. You're like you're like you're like a guy shopping when he's hungry at the grocery store when he's hungry. You're yeah. like, oh my god, I can yeah. buy that. That's exactly right. I could buy that forty-one yards of that. That's that. exactly who I am. I bought a lot of yardage, and uh, so I made the fifth pair in turquoise. And then, uh, of course, I start wearing the turquoise ones because I think they're really fun. And what better way to advertise your product to your classmates? And people knew that I'd done this. I was like the pants guy on campus because the, the previous year I'd been bugging them about like what pants do you like and right. you know people had like heard it can't of, be that many pants Bailey's the pants guy that's kind of funny like yeah. you know people were really supportive there it's a yeah, cool it's one of the, one of the things I think is one of the most redeeming qualities of the Bay Area is the collaboration and, and sort of supportive feeling you know it's sort of like a Burning Man thing you know it's like people just want to help you express yourself and build things and I'm, I'm deeply grateful to San Francisco and and Stanford for that, like what that sort of imbued in me and the confidence it gave me to, to try wacky things. That's cool. But I start wearing these turquoise cords and I'm giving the brown ones to my friends to try on. And lo and behold, several of the guys are like, hey, those brown ones fit well, but what I want is turquoise. And that's when I realized that other people might buy what I thought was sort of a, you know, a fourth or fifth standard deviation desire turned out to be like a, you know, one and a half standard deviation desire. I, my stats is escaping me at the moment, but what I'm trying to say is maybe like 20% of my customers actually wanted those wacky colors. So I went long on those, and they ended up being- so you're doing like analytics in your head on the turquoise. Oh yeah, I mean, I have tons of analytics, I love it. I, it was so fun to actually, we had, a, we had a class at Stanford called Data and Decisions, and it was fun to start generating data to make decisions, and it was like, really interesting. And so what I found, product market fit. I'm talking to all these guys, I'm handing them brown corduroys, and they're all like, actually, the turquoise ones are cool too. So I not only made turquoise, but I made sage green. They became the mint juleps, one of our best selling pants of all time. Lined with like a cool diamond fabric that was sort of reminiscent. I'm like, they're like the perfect Vegas pool pant when it's 70 degrees outside. Or like, they, you know, guys started saying, I gotta get more bonobos, not I gotta get more pants. And that was still when I was just selling them out of the trunk of my car. And that's when I felt like, okay, I got something. So, I might so, have something. So I wanna go into where you take the company, but. You told me something interesting we were talking the other day about one of your key professors actually taught the class in product market fit. Right. Talk about what you learned there and how that informed what you did as an early stage entrepreneur. Man, you know, I think, I think if there's something I would recall about Bill Barnett and Andy Rockleff's class, it's called product market fit. And it's a half semester or half quarter class, two credit course at Stanford. They still teach it today. Um, and it, students love it, is, is basically, a lot of money gets wasted in startups on products that the market doesn't actually need. And so the sooner you can figure out if people really want to buy what you're selling, there's some awesome entrepreneurs lurking here in 1871. There's like a hundred cool companies just waiting to get built where people are working really hard on stuff. I would, if I had advice for all of them and some of you, it would be do anything you can to get data and feedback from the market on what you're building. The mistake I made, and one of the things I learned about in product market fit that was probably less intuitive was competition means nothing. In a startup, execution is everything. And so what can you build, right? What can you go out and, and do, and how can you figure out, if the market likes what you're doing, don't worry about if other people are doing it too. Just get your head down and keep iterating and listen to your customers and go sell whatever it is yourself so that you can be chief salesperson. One of the things we pride ourselves on at Trump Club is like, when we were struggling, the first six months were really tough, every single member of the team took on a sales goal. Kevin Price, my CFO, John Tucker, our you know, head of user experience. These guys are not salespeople, they're highly analytical, they're super talented. They forced themselves to go out and sell to develop empathy and compassion for the sales team we've ultimately hired. Everything we do, at Trunk Club is built around supporting our sales team. And it's because we always think about what does the customer want, how do we learn from them, how do we provide them with a great service. And so product market fit for me is just like, you don't know what your customers are gonna want and buy. The hard part is people always think they do. And I think that's where the discipline of it's so important because yeah. there's a tendency to kind of fall in love with people's, own, you know, fall in love with your own whiteboard idea. And that, I think that advice to get out there is so important. Well, you gotta do both, right? Yeah. You, gotta, you gotta have vision if you're a founder. You gotta, you gotta believe in what you're selling. But you also have to be humble about what do people really want from you.